get started. You guys are chatty today. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off and continue with the wonderful topic of chromatography. So define chromatography. Yes, Elizabeth? Method of separation. Perfect, simple. It's used to separate components so that we can identify or detect, identify, and quantify. Okay, what is the difference between stationary phase, mobile phase, and what is the function of each micro? Stationary doesn't move. Yes. Mobile does. Mobile is for eluding substances, and then stationary is for bottoming up. Hold them, hold them. Stationary phase is very important in chromatography. In a sense, you want your compounds to interact with it. Oh. If it doesn't interact with it, we don't get separation. So the security phase, its role is to interact with the different components. So these components can be separated based on their like and dislike of the security phase or ability to absorb or dissolve depending on whether the security phase is solid or liquid. Okay, so it's very important. The mobile phase is to move things along. And sometimes we change the concentration of the mobile phase so that we call it to increase its strength so that it gets dissolute out. Remember the girl won't come out of the store unless you buy or something. So your mobile phase will have components that will allow your solute to move along faster and get out of the cone. We'll talk more about that. Okay, so there's three types of chromatography. Gretchen? Um, yeah. Fluid and yes, so sometimes we say type, sometimes we say technique. So yes, so we have HPLC or uh, liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, or supercritical super chromatography. Um, sometimes I ask you what's the mode of separation. So when I say in a question, what's the type or the technique, you have to tell me it's a GC, or LC, if I ask for mode of separation, then this will come later. We're going to say, okay, it's partition chromatography, uh, reverse phase, or partition chromatography, normal phase. Yes, Brittany. You said it's gas liquid, and then what's the last one? Supercritical. We'll, we'll define it. Yeah. Uh, would column chromatography count as another type as well? Or so GC is column chromatography, and LC is column chromatography as well. So the column chromatography means that your stationary phase is in a column. Okay. So uh, for GC, you have a column, and for HPLC, you have a column. So, um, so you have planar chromatography and column chromatography. These are two categories, mm -hmm. if you will. But in terms of type or technique, is it gas, gas chromatography or liquid chromatography or superphysical fluid chromatography? Yeah, and then when I say mode of separation, I want you to be more specific. It's partition reverse phase, it's partition normal, it is adsorption chromatography, ion exchange, affinity. We'll talk about all of these. So when I say mode of separation, then you need to know what is the physical chemical characteristics that allowing these solutes or compounds to separate. Okay, so you'll hear me talking about this a lot, so all of this might be a little bit foreign information, but I'll be talking about it a lot. So then you will be very familiar with it by the end. Okay, um, so what is your mobile phase in GC? And what form would your stationary phase be? Yes, Madison? Yes, 
So in gas chromatography, of it, well, of course, it's gas, your mobile phase, some will use gas chromatography. And then your stationary phase, you have to have a solid, and sometimes you have a liquid um, bound to that solid. So you have a solid support and a liquid, sometimes it's called gas liquid chromatography. But then Gary will talk more about the different types of stationary phase. Um, so what, same question, what is the mobile and stationary phase of partition chromatography? When we say partition chromatography, what does that mean to you? Habi? Liquid, liquid. So you have your compound partitioning between two liquid phases. Stationary phase is liquid, mobile phase is liquid. And when we say absorption chromatography, then what's your mobile phase? So it um, liquid, solid. liquid mobile phase and solid is your station. So when I say partition coefficient at equilibrium, what is it? Uh, Sammy? Um, the concentration of solute of solute in the mobile and the <clears throat> over concentration of solute in stationary phase. Absolutely. Concentration of solute in the mobile phase over the concentration of the solute in the stationary phase. And that is basically a constant when uh, we reach equilibrium. So what are some applications for uh, chromatography? Like the separation of macronutrients such as like protein or amino acids, fats, and sugars. So separation, let's be specific. Yeah, you can separate proteins. Yes, using chromatography, you can separate amino acids, after you lyophilize the protein to digital amino acids, you can use chromatography to determine amino acid composition. Yes, fatty acid composition, you'll be doing that in the lab. What else, Faye? Um, you can also look at different volatile flavors. Yes, flavor compounds. Uh, Gary will talk somewhat about that application. Yes, Saj? Adulteration. So if you have specific compounds, of a concern such as melamine, for example, um, you can uh, determine them using chromatography and mass spectrometry as well. Okay, so there's a lot of applications. We're going to talk about vitamin application as well, um, carbohydrate application. So there's a lot of application for chromatography, and during the next chapters, we're going to we talk about those different applications. Okay, so that's good. Every time I'll give you a little bit more of recap question that might repeat so that you get the concepts straight over the next few lectures, okay. All right, so in liquid chromatography, we have something we call planar chromatography and column chromatography. In gas chromatography, it's always column chromatography. So in, in liquid chromatography, we have a semi-quantitative or qualitative measure of separation. We have paper chromatography is one old method. And who, who has done paper chromatography in one of your labs? Yeah, probably a lot of you, and mostly, it, was it amino acid separation or lipid? What was it? We had to do it in very close, like we had to do, uh, yeah, so like we did it with like the uh, like that's all we did in a marker and just separating the different the colors, the different pieces, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Usually, also, when you have a proper lab, we also do separation of amino acids, which is very common because they give you pretty colors. So, you separate them and then you spray them with one hydrant, and then you get colors and you can see the spot. So with paper chromatography, it's basically a paper made up of cellulose and your stationary phase is liquid. So you impregnate the cellulose with water. So kind of like dip paper in water and now you have water as your stationary phase with cellulose as your solid support. And then your um, mobile phase is the solvent that is admissible with water that means it doesn't mix. And oftentimes it's like, a hexane, for example, an organic nonpolar solvent. So what we do is we usually draw a line like an inch 
away from the beginning of the paper or the edge of the paper. And then you do spots. Your first part is a marker, something that would be a reference, a marker. Um, yeah, like something to help you with that identification. And then you have your samples. You, you spot them. And then you take your paper and you put it in a development chamber. And you have a specific solvent in there, that, that immiscible solvent. And you keep it in that chamber until the solvent reaches the top of the paper or a certain place that you mark. You stop it where the solvents reach a certain space. And then you have your the constituents separated. You might not see them at first if they don't have color. Like you're not using a marker with color. You're using, uh, you're separating compounds that are not visible. What you would do in this case is you try to make them visible. So after you separate, if it's amino acids, for example, you spray it in hydrogen and primary acid. Each amino acid gives you a specific color. If they are colorless and you don't have a specific you know, compound to react with it, you can sometimes measure them or visualize them with like auto radiography. In this case, it's separating glucose from sucrose and potentially another sugar. Sometimes when you're separating using water and hexane, some of the components don't separate very well. Like here, you can have an overlap. So you try to determine how these compounds are different and then choose another solvent that can separate them a little better to enhance resolution. So we call this 2D technique. So you do your first dimensional separation, then you take that paper, you flip it, and then you immerse it in another solvent that will enable further separation. We do this in other types of separation, which is we call it gel electrophoresis. We'll talk about that in the proteins chapter, where you can do the first dimension separation, and then a second dimension based on differences in physical chemical characteristics of the compound. So you really need to know your characteristic of the compounds in order to select the different solvents. Now, one measurement that we use for some quantification is called the relative mobility. So the relative mobility factor is basically you measure the distance from the start to the midpoint of your spot. And you call that distance moved by the component. And then you measure the distance from your line here to the solvent front. And you call that distance moved by solvent. And then you get R values that you can compare to identify different components within your mixture. However, this is not the, good, not the greatest technique because you have a lot of variability that can happen with paper chromatography. This is affected by how thick the paper is. What is the humidity in the, in the developing chamber? Uh, the developing distance, so the distance that the solvent uh, moves could be different from one experiment to the other. The temperature at which you uh, develop your uh, paper chromatography. So all of these factors can influence your R value. Therefore, when you're running the sample, you want to run your all of your samples or most of them, if you're able to put them on one paper along with your values. Therefore, it's better to compare within the same paper, not across. Okay, so it's the distance from the spot to the center of, of the spot after you're done developing. So that would be the distance that your compound will. And then the distance moved by the solvent is you would know when the solvent front is or where the solvent front is. When you stop the development, you can visually see where the solvent reached. 
and you measure that distance, and that would be the distance from the fiber source. So in paper photography, it can also be reverse phase. So when water is the stationary phase, it's normal phase because now your uh, compounds are interacting with the water. The water is the stationary phase and your mobile phase is your organic solvent. That's normal phase. But you can swap that. You can impregnate the paper with non-polar solvent and then develop with a polar solvent. That is reverse phase. In some cases, you can, um, what you call it, derivatize the OH groups of cellulose to carry a functional group that is either has acid characteristics or base characteristics. So that means it will be charged. Then you can separate based on charge. If it carries an acid characteristic, it would be negatively charged. So you can separate positively charged compound. We'll talk more about ion exchange in more detail. But if it's carrying a base molecule, it would be positively charged. So you can separate ions that are negatively charged because positive and negative interact with each other. And that's how you separate. So you can make that paper um, Derivatized that way. It's very rare. You don't see that because now with the development of column chromatography, it's very rare that you actually do a lot of paper chromatography. Okay. So in reverse phase paper chromatography, when you have your stationary phase organic solvent impregnated, and then your mobile phase is water. Which of these? Is correct. Yes, Dara? A. a is correct. Is A the only correct one that you see? What what is it? Yeah. C. Yes. So when you're having water as your mobile phase, your polar uh, compounds will want to want to move with the water. Okay. So they will move the furthest. So by moving the furthest, then the RF value will be higher. Okay. The layer chromatography or TLC. What's the other TLC stands for what other than thin layer chromatography? TLC, what does it stand for? Tender love and care. <laughs> yes. So many years ago, I was teaching this class and then went to pick up my daughter from daycare. So she was sad and sitting in uh, on the lap of one of the teachers and I said, what's going on? And she said, your daughter needed TLC today. And in my mind, in layer mm -hmm. chromatography. <laughs> Why would my daughter need thin layer chromatography? And that was the first time I heard about tender love and care. I didn't, even, <laughs> I didn't even know about that. Okay, so now you will remember TLC in two different ways. Okay, similar principle to paper chromatography. So the same principle, except it's much better in resolution. That means much better in separation. So what happens in and thin layer chromatography is you have a support uh, that is inert. So aluminum or glass uh, support. Um, and then um, what happens is you have a layer of silica. For example, it's very common that you would have a layer of silica. Now you can purchase these uh, pre-made, but a few years ago when I was a student, we had to pour it ourselves. So you get a glass plate, you clean it, there's a certain protocol, you mix your silica and then you spread it and you want to make sure it's even. So it's a lot of work, but it's fun to work with and develop your own thin layer uh, plate. But it has better resolution than paper because you have your silica that has very fine particle size and it, it's consistent. So in paper, particle size is not consistent. You have differences in thickness, but usually when you pour or develop these plates, you have a very consistent thickness. 
you have very small particle size. So you have really good separation, better resolution at least than uh, paper chromatography. And it's faster, the development time is faster or the movement is faster and better reproducibility. That means when you run uh, same samples on multiple plates, you get good results that are reproducible. So it is a thin layer, basically. So 250 micrometer in thickness of your sorbent or your security phase. And like I said, you have an inner support that can be glass, aluminum, plastic sometimes, but it's mostly when you buy them, they're aluminum foil. Um, and when we used to pour them, we used to pour them on glass plates. Uh, the sorbent is silica or alumina or cellulose. So you can run them as absorption chromatography. Let's say if you have silica, you don't have to um, impregnate it with any solvent. You can run it directly and separate based on polarity. Or you can have water as uh, an impregnated solvent. Or you can have uh, run it as reverse phase or ion exchange as well uh, with silica can be derivatized with functional groups that have charge, then you can run it as ion exchange. So again, same with paper chromatography. So when you're running your different compounds, they don't necessarily have a color. You can see them, but if they're amino acids, you can spray them with an hydrant. Otherwise, with different compounds, if you spray with sulfuric acid, they burn. So you can see the spots where it's burnt. So you know that there's an, some compound there. Or either a vapor can give you a color, but it's non-destructive. So the color can, can disappear um, over time. And you can use it as semi-quantitative where you can measure absorption or fluorescence. So if you react with dichlorofluorescein, for example, and you would get a compound that fluoresces, then you can measure fluorescence. Or you can measure radioactivity if you have labeled your compounds with radioactive uh, mold. So there are different ways. Um, like I said, it can be quantitative in some sort. If you have a densometer, so you can actually measure the density or the intensity of the spot. And you can relate, relate that to concentration, or you can scrub off your um, where the compound is, and then you can run it through um, a cleaning column. For example, a resin that can particularly interact with your components and purify it, and then quantify it using different analyses. Um, so, but oftentimes it's used to, to visualize differences. So for example, if you're a nutrition major, you could have potentially taken Dan Gallagher's class, or you will be taking it this spring, where they separate um, different components of that. So phospholipids, um, monoacid glycerol, diacyl, p-fatty acid, and triacid glycerol. So they, you can see differences among uh, the sample by running standards and then running your sample to see what components of fat you have in your sample. Any questions? All right. So color chromatography is what we're going to spend some time on because that's most of the applications are using column chromatography. So there is low pressure column chromatography and there's high pressure or high performance column chromatography. So with column chromatography, so you have columns with different sizes. So they come in different lengths, uh, different diameter, I can be much wider than that as well. So this is what I found in my lab. We have different sizes and usually you pack them. You can get them pre-packed, but you can also pack them with your stationary phase. And you can 
um, then uh, use them for different separation. So what you would link them to, you really need a pump is that would pump a solvent in the column. So your column now has a stationary phase and the stationary phase packing, when you pack the column, there's certain procedure. So you would prepare a slurry of your uh, stationary phase and then you pack it under pressure to reach a certain height within your column. So you have your stationary phase and then you have your mobile phase that will be pumped onto your column. So sometimes you have one solvent, sometimes you have two solvents. Okay, so this brings me to something really important for you to remember. Isocratic versus gradient mobile phase. What does anybody know the difference between or what does it mean when we say isocratic? What does that word mean to you, isocratic? Does it mean anything to you? Not necessarily in chromatography. Yes, Lenny? Huh? It's not gradient. Oh, this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not gradient, yes. <laughs> what does it really mean? It means there's no change in your mobile phase. The mobile phase remains the same throughout the entire run. Isocratic, doesn't change. So that means you have one solvent, or not two, one solvent that you're pumping into the cone and it's not changing. You are able to separate your compounds without having to change the concentration of your mobile phase over time. This is often used in size exclusion chromatography, for example. And we'll talk about that later. But this, this way, it's very simple. Same mobile phase goes through. Usually you have an injection port where the sample is injected on the top of the column and the sample starts moving, the components within the sample start moving along with the mobile phase and they start interacting with your system phase. Based on how they interact, they get separate. Some move further down the column faster with the mobile phase, some get detained. Okay, so basically, the gradient illusion is something very, very common in chromatography. With gradient illusion, you have sometimes two solvents, sometimes three, sometimes four, that you would mix them throughout the run and therefore changing the concentration of the mobile. Okay. Remember when I told you we need to let that kid leave the store, so we need to give it something to come out with it. So if my compound is, let's say the column is polar, then my compound is very polar and it's interacting very strongly with the stationary phase. And my mobile phase is not polar, so it's not going to like the mobile. The non-polar compounds are going to move along with the mobile phase, but my polar compound is going to be detained. It's going to move by diffusion down the column, but very, very slowly. So what do I do? With it? I can't have the whole day, six hours, to do my sample. It will come out eventually, but it will be very, very slow. So I increase the strength of the mobile phase. This is very important terminology that you'll be hearing that a lot. I'm going to increase the strength of the mobile phase. Okay, in this example, what did I tell you? In this example, I said the stationary phase is polar, the mobile phase is non polar. How can I increase the strength of the mobile phase so that the polar compounds move? faster after separation. How do I increase the strength of the mobile phase? Michael, give it a go. More polar? Yes, we don't switch out, we mix it 
with water, let's say we, we have acetonitra, mm -hmm. and then I start putting more water to mix with the acetonitra to make it a little bit more forward. So now my mobile phase, my compounds will move better with my mobile phase. So my mobile phase became stronger in comparison to the stationary phase. Do you want to repeat? Okay. okay, so my station phase is full, my mobile phase is not full. I have compounds that are interacting strongly with my polar part. I want them to come out done. We got separation. I want them to come out in a shorter time. So I want to make my mobile phase stronger that competes with the column characteristics. So I introduce water to my non-polar mobile phase. So by introducing water, then I have some polarity now in my mobile phase. So my polar compounds that are stuck or delayed of the column will say, oh, now the mobile phase is better. So I'm just going to go in the mobile phase and move faster. Okay. Um, so does that mixing happen after the non-polar has already come out? Or does that mixing happen before? <laughs> it varies. So you build your gradient based on the compounds that you have. By ex with experience, you can see where your compounds are evolving. We'll, we'll give you an example when I talk about HPLC. So you see that oh, the, all of my non-polar compounds already started to come out. So now I can change the structure, the characteristic of my mobile phase so the other compounds can come out. Yeah. So it happens at different time points. So an example that you just told us twice, that's an example of a gradient. Uh, yeah, that's an example of a gradient okay. mobile phase. So the first one where we did increase the strength, that isocratic? Isocratic, when okay. you don't change anything, so your mobile phase from beginning to end is the same concentration, that's isocratic. Okay. Oh, I'm guessing like increasing the strength would save you time, or are there other reasons why you want to increase strength? Reduce the time of your run. You're always, as an analyst, you want to be the most efficient. You want to get separation, but you want to do it in the shortest time possible. Do you have a comparison of like what it would be before increasing? Was it after? Yes, we will have lots of examples when we talk about HPLC. I'll give you lots of examples, but let's say Iran can be an hour and a half at isocratic. At some point, if you introduce gradient, you can being shortened it to 45 minutes or 30 minutes. So it depends on your compound. Sometimes it gets tricky that two compounds are very close in characteristics. You need to have isocratic. Otherwise, if you increase the strength too much, you cannot get separation anymore. They will both move out very fast. So you play around with how you hold your gradient. Yes. I had a question regarding the strength. Can you start to mix the quadrants to adjust the flow rates? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you don't mix manually. <laughs> Usually you have pumps. Um, whether you have a low pressure or high pressure, low pressure, you would have a peristaltic pump. But at least you will have pumps that will you can regulate the flow, um, your speed of how and then how much of the solvent So you will have a mixer that helps mixing. You won't do it usually manually, maybe in 30, 40 years ago you did, but um, nowadays you have pumps and you can adjust the flow rate and you have a mixer because your your um, solvent needs to be really mixed. So um, does it depend on what kind of chromatography you're doing for if the mobile phase is full or not full, or if it looks the same? Ah, that's a great question. Ahead of your time. Yes, it depends on the type of chromatography you have. So in this particular example I gave you, increasing the strength was adding more water. In reverse phase chromatography is the opposite. The example with river space is your column is non polar and your mobile phase is mostly water. Okay, polar. To increase the strength in the system is instead of adding water, sorry, water, you add organic solvent. 
So increasing the strength can go in any direction. If it's normal phase, increasing the strength will be adding water. If it is reverse phase, increasing the strength will be adding organic solvent. In ion exchange, increasing the strength can be adding salt or changing the pH. So different chromatography, you increase the strength based on the characteristics of your column. Is that answer? Yes, sir? So is the problem where you have to have some kind of, uh, where the so if, if our compounds, and is that a letter P to see if I heard it correct. If the compounds are very uh, close in characteristic, you ask that aspheric is our only solution. Yeah, or is there any way you can make that in some kind of normal composition? Okay, so that you're asking a very good question, and that comes with experience and developing methods of separation. So sometimes you really have to change the solvent. If you're using water and acetonitrile, you're not getting good separation because these two compounds are interacting very similarly with the column. If you swap acetonitrile with methanol, which is a more polar organic solvent, then you get better separation of these two compounds. So you play around with the mobile phase that you have to see how you can enhance how can you can enhance the separation of compounds that are very similar in characteristic? I like these questions because this is going to lead us later when I talk about resolution of two peaks. All of these things we're talking about now will help understand that part of chromatography. Okay, so um, another thing I want to talk about is the column dimension. So I don't know if you remember last time I said the longer the column is, the better is the resolution. The longer and the thinner, the, the uh, what do you call it, the smaller diameter it is, and the longer it is in length, the better separation you're going to get. And we're going to talk about that when we cover resolution of peaks from each other. Because if you remember with the example of the tubes, with the extraction, the more tubes you have, the more equilibrium number of equilibrium you're going to get, the better separation you're going to achieve between your uh, compound. So the longer the dimension of, the longer the column is, the better is the resolution. So you want to find a balance though, when you are a, an analyst in a lab, you want to find the balance between what is more efficient in terms of time? What gives me an acceptable separation too? So am I after perfect separation or am I after partial separation and still the ability to identify? Or am I after finishing analysis in the shortest amount of time possible? So then you adjust your choice of color dimensions, isocratic versus gradient and so on. So again, just keep in mind some of these concepts because I will repeat them again when we talk about resolution and when we talk about the thickness of your stationary phase, the length of the column, the number of theoretical plates, all of these. So we will get to them, don't get overwhelmed. We will cover them um, very um, in detail and slowly. Okay. Very briefly, I'll go over supercritical fluid chromatography. We're not going to talk about a lot of applications here. It's just an introductory to what it is. Um, so it is a type of chromatography where your mobile phase is a liquid gas. So that means it's a gas ab above the critical pressure. So when CO2 is above its critical pressure, it becomes liquid. So in this case, your uh, CO2 is in liquid form. And the benefit of that, it has high diffusivity. That means it moves faster along the column. It's not thick, it's very uh, uh, flowy. It is, um, so it has low viscosity. 
and then you can have faster uh, separations because it moves faster and more easily between the stationary phase um, into the stationary phase and out of the column. So you get better resolution. And liquid CO2 is a nonpolar um, liquid. It has a nonpolar characteristic. So it's mostly used for separation of nonpolar molecules that are thermally labile. So when you have nonpolar molecules, you often think, can I do GC and, and separate them with GC? But if they're thermally labile, they're going to degrade in your GC because of the temperature gradient. So then running them using a supercritical fluid contour would work well. So um, sometimes we add methanol to make, to make the mobile phase a little bit more polar. Methanol is a polar, more polar, relatively polar organic solvent. So sometimes you can do that. So basically, the stationary phase can be similar to that of high-performance liquid chromatography, and we're going to talk about different types of stationary phases here in a minute. And then, um, so the equipment is similar. You have pumps, you have a column, and then you will have um, a detector. However, the detector will be similar to the detector used in gas chromatography. Again, these will be covered. Gary's going to cover all the detectors used for a gas chromatography, and I'm going to cover the stationary phases used in HPLs. So this is really all you need to know about supercritical, is that it has stationary phases similar to HPLC, detectors similar to GC. The mobile phase is unique, which is a liquid CO2. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to step into um, modes of separation. So this is a, a common term that you will be hearing. What is the mode of separation? Mode of separation is basically I'm talking about physical chemical principle of um, chromatographic separation. So what is the principle behind the separation we use for different uh, chromatography? So this is now purely liquid chromatography. Gas chromatography will be covered uh, with here. So purely liquid chromatography, we have different physical chemical principles. So I'll introduce them today, and then we'll, we'll talk more detail next time on, on each. So we have adsorption chromatography. With adsorption chromatography, you have your stationary phase is solid, and your solute or compounds of interest are absorbing on the surface. They are absorbing via hydrogen bonding, via ion, uh, ion bridges, via hydrophobic interactions, via Van der Waals interactions. So they could be separating purely based on polarity, or they could be separating based on specific characteristics. So please remember that ion exchange and affinity chromatography are forms of adsorption chromatography, okay? Where you don't have, you have a solid phase and you have functional groups on the solid phase where your compounds are interacting with these functional groups. Another form that is not shown here is hydrophobic interaction chromatography. There is also hydrophilic interaction chromatography. But hydrophobic interaction chromatography is also another form of adsorption chromatography, where your compounds are adsorbing to the surface of the stationary phase via specific interaction. If their interactions are ion specific, then this is ion exchange. If interactions are very unique, like the like the key and the lock, that would be affinity chromatography. So enzyme and enzyme inhibitor, for example, um, or antibody in an antigen. So a very specific interaction is a call for affinity chromatography. Now in ion exchange chromatography, your stationary phase can carry a negative charge. 
So when my stationary phase carries a negative charge, what can I separate? A positively charged molecules or a negatively charged molecules? The is negative. The is negative charge. Yeah, the stationary carries functional groups that are negatively charged or acid groups. So I'm separating positively charged compounds. Remember, this is the important concept of your compounds need to interact with your signal. They do not interact with the nucleotides, they don't separate. So interaction is key. So if I have a negatively charged um, stationary phase, I am exchanging, this is ion exchange, I am exchanging ions that are positively charged between my stationary phase and my mobile phase. So exchange them going from the mobile phase to the stationary phase. So when I say anion exchange, what does it mean? Anion exchange chemical here. There's anion exchange and there's cation exchange in those last few minutes. Let's talk about anion exchange. What does it mean? What am I exchanging? Yes. Negatively charged ions. Yes. So I am exchanging negatively charged ions. So my stationary phase is positively charged or negatively charged? Gretchen. So if it is anion exchange, I'm exchanging negatively charged ions. So my stationary phase then is positively charged. Yes. So this is a common um, kind of um, confusion for students when I say anion exchange versus cation exchange. They hear anion exchange and they think the stationary phase is negatively charged. No, the anion or cation is following the compounds that I am separating. So I am exchanging negatively charged ions. That means my chromatography or the column or the stationary phase has positively charged um, functional groups. When I say cation exchange, then my functional groups are negatively charged and I am exchanging uh, positively charged ions. So this is, we will talk more about it repeatedly, but this is the introduction of it. Partition chromatography, we already talked about it. We have a solid support, and then you have a liquid linked adsorbed to that support, and then your compound of interest is dissolving in that liquid. So it dissolves in the liquid and the mobile phase, so it partitions at equilibrium between the two liquid phases. Molecular exclusion is the same as gel permeation, it's the same as size exclusion. It's different over the history. I don't know. It just got multiple names, but all means separation based on size. So you will hear um, size exclusion, you hear molecular exclusion, uh, exclusion, and then you hear gel permeation. They all mean separation based on the size of the molecule. So you would have um, your stationary phase is made up of a polymer that has different pore sizes. And then your molecules are going to go through the different pore sizes. The smaller the molecule, it will go into all the pore sizes and get delayed the most. The larger ones won't have access to all the pores, then it would migrate through the column faster. So in size exclusion, the bigger the molecule comes up first, and the smallest, the more smaller the molecule is, the more it is detained in the column because it just keeps going into the particle, uh, into the pore size or pores of the particles that will pack your column. So again, this is just a graphic introducing each one of those, but we will cover them in more detail 
next time. So there you go. Thank <laughs> you.